Welcome to the One Church Podcast. Within this podcast, you'll encounter content that will instill hope, fortify your faith, offer practical real-life insights, spread the love of Jesus, and inspire you to fulfill your unique purpose. So now, please stay tuned as we prepare to delve into this week's message. I wanted to share my story of of how I'm here now, standing and preaching uh, the Word of God. How does a politician's kid from India now become a preacher of the gospel is, is Jesus, is Jesus alone, who can take someone like me, going to the clubs, rolling joints for people, all my friends love marijuana, everything, now I'm here holding the word of God. Who does that? The Holy Spirit does that. I'm not raised in a polished home, uh, a, you know, maybe my parents were God-fearing, but you know, they basically, my dad just said, go enjoy, have fun. <laughs> that was a motto. And I lived life, but my life changed for me at 19 years old. And 19 years old is when everything changed. I immigrated to the U.S. when I was six and a half years old from, uh, raised on a farm in, in, uh, in India, um, and uh, migrated to Queens, New York. And what a culture shock that was, landing at JFK in 1994. Um, and um, my dad went from a very high position to working at a very low position. And I always uh, think to myself, I thank God that he brought us very low, that we can see and, and develop a dependency that we need God. We need Jesus. I mean, growing up, I was raised in a very traditional home. The only thing I was taught uh, when I was younger was the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as he forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And I would say that over and over and over. Uh, because I, when I was young, I asked my dad, uh, who I love now, and uh, he's changed a lot over the years. But at, at nine or ten years old, uh, not being integrated into the school system, I asked my dad, you know, maybe an existential question of maybe what you maybe, maybe people ask this question later in life, but I asked this when I was 10. I said, what happens after you die? And, I, and looking at my dad and, you know, knowing that, like, you know, he probably has the answer for everything, seeing him being a leader for people and settling disputes and being in high-level positions, he looked at me and he said, oh, nothing, it's just pitch black darkness. And, and he was so, he wasn't bothered by it. He was so content with that answer. And I looked at him and I was terrified. He was, he was fine. But I'm 10, nine year old me is like, my good, we're just going to die? And I just said, we're just going to, we're just going to cease to exist. That thought really bothered me. As a nine, I'm not even 40 or like, you know, midlife crisis or anything like that. I'm nine years old. I'm having a midlife, well, a crisis. Uh, and, um, it is true what the Bible says, God sets eternity in the hearts of men. All of you, all of you, whatever religion, background, creed you are, eternity is in your heart. Every creation knows its creator. And there's something deep down inside of you that is yearning for that answer. There has to be something more than this life. There has to be. I mean, are we just a bunch of cells that have come together and we have a consciousness and we live and, and you know, and we just cease to exist? Why? Then I, then I thought to myself, why, why should I go to school? Why should I get a degree? Why should I get a job? If I'm just going to die one day, I'm not going to take any of this with me. And, you know, since, um, since no one, you know, my family really, we didn't really under, understand trauma or anxiety or stress, I developed um, uh, severe chronic depression severe anxiety and panic attacks and obsessive compulsive disorder from 10 years old. I remember I'd be sitting in my, uh, I, I lived with my aunt and uncle, and I'd be sitting in my room, and I would just be crying. I mean, like, just crying. I was 10 years old. I didn't have nothing to worry about. But I, I was just crying. And my aunt, she's a nurse, she, knows, she noticed something was wrong. She said, what's wrong? And I, she asked my mom, I remember her asking my mom, what's wrong with your son? My mom didn't know what to answer because nobody knew what it was. And uh, I realized now, I was in deep sorrow, deep depression, and I, basically suffered from that for 10 years of my life until 19 years old. Um, so I did what any other teenager did. I self-medicated myself. Uh, and the only, uh, you know, since my parents, they didn't know what to, they didn't really consider this what it was. And maybe in our culture, it's like taboo when you talk about mental illness. But since this is what God set me free from, I use it as a platform to share this, what God set me free from. And I'm not ashamed of it because it's my testimony. And we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So, I, I did what any other teenager did. I self-medicated myself since I didn't know how else to get. I hated fear. I hated fear. 
I hated anxiety. I would always tell people, I not only felt fear, I, I, the, the best way I could describe it is I was baptized in fear. I mean, I, I, fear crippled my life for a decade. I remember when I was um, in school in, 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 um, um, in New York Park, when I went to middle school, I was on the blacktop. Anytime I would hear an ambulance, the only form of security, you have to realize as an immigrant, um, only form of security that I noticed my parents, anytime I heard the ambulance, I thought my dad or mom died. That, I mean, that was just, every time I hear an ambulance go by or the sirens, for whatever reason, it would trigger this crazy anxiety that my parents are dead. And, I, and I, would, I remember I would be frozen in fear, and I would not play with the other kids, and I would just stand by myself trying to figure out how to deal with this until at 3 p.m. when I see my dad, every day is a relief. <sighs> okay, he's okay. Because I, lo- I love my dad, and I love my mom. And, and uh, so I found what every other teenager found. I found video games, and I escaped into a world full of video games. And I basically, it was so good. It was so good. It, it took away all my fear and anxiety. It just numbed it and suppressed it, never dealt with it. And I remember it ruined my social life because, you know, I would have friends in high school said, hey, you want to go bowling or this or that? I would make up some excuse because I just loved escaping this other world. And I would stay up till late at night, 5, 6 a.m. And my parents, even though they, weren't, they didn't really know God, it got to such a point with such a problem, they had to fast and pray that I would come out of that because of such a bondage. And um, at 19 years old, December 1st, I had a very unique experience. Uh, I, I, I often share my testimony, but I know there's a lot of newcomers here, and I felt I have to share this. And um, at 19 years old, I had a very unique experience. I felt this, uh, this knot in my throat, and uh, it, this, it started December 1st, 2006. I remember it, it went from 11.59 to 12 midnight, and it started. This knot in my throat. I went to my parents' room. Because uh, if I go in my parents' room, I, they know it's something wrong. Because I don't just walk in there at midnight. I said, you know, I, something just doesn't feel right. And um, what happened next is I went, um, I stayed in my parents' ro- bedroom, and I was convulsing till 5 a.m. Every couple of hours, my body would start convulsing, and I would go to sleep, and my body would start convulsing. Um, and I remember I, I could feel my mom holding down one arm, my dad holding down the other arm. And the next morning, I get up, and I collapse back onto my couch. And this is during undergrad, finals week. And I thought, I'll just, I'll just sleep this off, you know. Um, and the next day, it gets worse. I lose my ability to eat. I lose my ability to go to the bathroom. All I could do is drink water. And I have no idea what's going on with my body. I've experienced fear. I've experienced panic attacks. I've experienced anxiety. But this was like physically, uh, my body was shutting down. And this was strange and unusual. And, uh, you know, I thought each day just get better, just get worse. And uh, I think a couple of days later, my dad um, looks at me and my, my dad and mom, and they realize something's really wrong. And I say, let's go to, a, you know, your doctor, our primary care physician. So he, he had to drive me there. Every time I would I stand up, I would faint. And I went to my uh, primary care physician. He looked at me, and he knew something's wrong. He took my blood test, took my physical, and said, come back three days later. We'll tell you what's wrong with you. And those three days were the worst days of my life because I thought either I'm going to be on medication for the rest of my life or the doctors will not be able to diagnose me. My last hope was in medicine, uh, in, in the physician. Um, and we, we come back three days later. My mom tells me, you know, it's okay. Everything's going to be all right. And this whole process was horrible, but those three days was really horrible. And I go back to the doctor, and he has a whole stack of medical reports and he's looking at me and my dad, looking at the reports, and he said, you know, your physical is completely normal. Your blood tests are completely negative. From a medical standpoint, you are completely healthy. So, you know, I looked at my dad. We, we didn't have anything to say, so we just drove back home, and I'm, I'm in this condition for one month and 20 days. One month and 20 days, and I remember in the latter portion of December, I could eat a little bit of soup, vitamin water, and I, I had enough strength just to move around. Uh, I remember my cousin invited me to church one day. That didn't, you know, it didn't go well with me. I don't know. I just had a lot of anxiety. And then my friends uh, invited me to go with them to the mall. I went out, and they, I mean, these are not believers. They, they took one look at me, and they said, wow, it looks like you're dying or like death hit you. I mean, people could tell something is horribly wrong. And um, come back, and uh, uh, it started December 1st, 2006. And at January 19th or 20th, um, 2007 is when my whole life changes. Um, I'm, I'm lying on my couch, and, you know, at this whole time, I, I still don't, I've, I've asked God to heal me. I, I, the only thing I knew how to pray was the Psalms. That I didn't know what, what else to pray. I would just pray the Psalms. 
And uh, I remember one time I did pray, I saw the light come on in my living room, and I thought, that's odd, you know, I was, nobody was there to turn that on, it just came on, but I, I felt like God was giving me little signs, but he never healed me completely, until January uh, 19th uh, or 20th of 2007, I'm lying on my couch, my parents go to work, my brother goes to school, and lying on my couch, and all of a sudden my heart starts palpitating. And uh, I know what a panic attack is, but this is nothing like a panic attack. I felt like the, uh, there's no way a human heart can race this fast. It was, raised, it was palpitating so fast that I thought my heart was going to rupture. And it, that was terrifying in itself. And I, and I remember the next moment, I, really, I don't really know how to describe this next moment, but it's what you call like the last stages of consciousness on this earth. I, I think the medical field calls it near-death experience. But I knew, I don't know how to describe this, but I knew I was going to die. I don't know how to describe this, but I was slipping away. I was losing my consciousness, and I knew I was about to die. And the most terrible feeling is that you know you're going to die, but you don't know what's on the other side. I remember growing up, I'm always taught there's nothing after death. And I had these, these set of questions that came to my mind before this last moment. And the, this was a question. Um, I thought, is, is, uh, is there a God? Is, is Islam the right way? Is Hinduism the right way? I come from India, a land of 300 million gods. So Hinduism is, we had all different religions, faiths come to our house. So is, is Islam the right way? Is Hinduism the right way? Is Buddhism the right way? Is Jesus the right way? And then, I, then the, the most uh, horrifying question came, and I thought, what if there is no God? And I'm about, I'm about to lose my life. And at that, you know, I grew up in Sunday school, went to church, but I never thought any of this stuff was real. I just went because my parents wanted me to go. But at that moment, when I knew I could not control this next stage of my life, which is death, you know, when you're, when you're scared so much, you just want control over everything. And I, at that moment, I lost all control. And, I, and, and, you know, it's like that song says, I surrender all. You know, in reality, we should be singing, I surrender 75%. <laughs> I don't know if we know what it means to say, I surrender all. But at that moment, it, without my permission, I surrendered all. It, death, the feeling of death was so terrifying. And I don't know why, but out of my mouth, I just said, Jesus, I don't care. You have my life. And I said that because I didn't care, because uh, living was a nightmare. I thought dying would be better. And I, had, I, I wanted to save my life because, you know, you don't want to die. And I was so terrified of dying. I just said, Jesus, I don't care. This is too much for me. I don't, you have my life. And the minute I said his name, uh, from the top of my head, I felt this incredible peace. And it started flowing right through my torso. And I could feel this tangible peace go down right through, down my legs, right down my hands. And it, it was like the peace I've never felt in my life before. And it knocked me out. I felt like I went to sleep for three hours. I went to sleep for two minutes. And I get up, and I'm completely healed of whatever this was. And then I praise God. At that moment, I realized Jesus is the name that is above every other name. Every Sunday school story I heard, everything I ever heard about Jesus that I didn't fully understand, I realized there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. And that is the only reason I'm standing before you today, because of the resurrection power that raised me from the dead. Praise God. And I just thought how fitting to share that on an Easter Sunday morning. That, that power saved me in 2000. It's still in the 21st century. That man who lived in Israel, who called himself God, is still saving millions and millions of souls still today. And today might be your day. And then from then on, you know, I didn't have any, any uh, proper church uh, discipline or fellowship. And I fell back into the world. I fell back into a lot of party scenes and all this stuff. And a friend invited me to church. And I got there. I got discipled. And I felt the tangible love of God. And I got plugged into a house, into a church. And from then on, I fully gave my life saying, Jesus, I surrender. I was like a prodigal, came back home and gave my life fully to the Lord all my, uh, from early 20s and just been fully serving the Lord and find myself in Chicago now. But with all that said, I wanted to let you know who's standing before you. I'm not a perfect person. I'm a sinner that's been saved by the blood of Jesus. And I'm telling others how to find life. And it's only through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Amen. So we've been talking. We've been talking this whole weekend about altars. 
altars. What are altars? And I know maybe there's a lot of new, new folks here, new beginners, and this might be a lot of, um, you know, different information to all of you. But I want to talk about how the church of God today, we talked about it yesterday. It was a heavy word, but I do know that God was speaking to us about the altars that we set up as a point of contact between God and man and how we meet the Lord. Today on Resurrection Sunday, if we can understand what Jesus has opened up for us, what Jesus has made available for us today as the church of Jesus Christ, we can live in complete victory. You know there's power over your sin, power to give you life, to live a dominant Christian life. You are the church of the firstborn from the dead. You are the church of Jesus Christ And if you understand what is available for the church, basically what I want to talk about today, if you can can turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. This is after Jesus' resurrection. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. And I know I'm dealing with a demographic who are maybe new to the faith. Some are very seasoned in the faith and some... You know, our in-between and our growth, but I pray that my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will make this understandable for all of you today. Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus rose from the dead. Remember, these, these disciples, they placed their faith fully on the Messiah, on Jesus. He called himself the Son of God. They didn't understand the cross yet. They didn't understand crucifixion yet. They, these, these men, who were mostly fishermen, tax collectors, the, the, the outcasts of society followed him. And Jesus kept telling them, I'm going to a cross. He kept doing signs, wonders, and miracles. They did not understand what the cross was about. But the cross today is what saves us. The blood is what washes us. And we're redeemed by that. But see, they didn't understand Easter Sunday. They didn't have an Easter Sunday yet. They're Jewish. They don't celebrate Easter. They didn't know what this meant. They had Jesus, and they didn't want to lose Jesus because Jesus kept feeding them, uh, kept transforming their lives, kept multiplying bread, and wherever they went, dead people came back to life. Lepers were cleansed. The demonized were set free. So they're like, this is amazing. Following Jesus is amazing. But Jesus kept telling them something. I'm about to be crucified. I'm going to a cross, and you don't realize this now. They didn't understand it, but it was for their redemption. Because I don't know if you know this or not, all this is based on a Jewish sacrificial system, as Ansi, our sister Ansi was saying before. In order for man to approach God, there was a, a format that God had instituted to one man through a man called Abraham in that time and called him into the land of Canaan. Right? He was from Mesopotamia, called this one man into Canaan, which is now Israel today, and formed the nation of Israel. And through the nation of Israel, God said, gave them laws and said, you're going to be this. You're going to live like this. You're not going to be like the other nations. You're going to be different. You're going to live with different set of laws and rules. And then he gave them a system how to approach God. Basically, every religion had a way to call to God. But God himself, the real God, the true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob revealed to them how you're going to approach me. And it was through a tabernacle. It was through what we call, they had basically a tent set up. And inside was a house. It had furnitures. One was a menorah. It was like a lampstand. There was another altar of incense. And then there's another curtain. Behind that, there's something called the mercy seat, which is called the Ark of the Covenant. And a high priest enters that place once a year with the blood of a bull to sprinkle on the mercy seat to make atonement for the nation of Israel. And these were all foreshadowing ultimately to a greater sacrifice. And when Jesus showed up on the scene, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not the sin of Israel, the sin of the world. He's a Jewish Messiah, but but their own people rejected him. So now what we, from uh, different parts of the world, all nations, all tribes, comes and worships this Jewish Messiah. And isn't that incredible? Even today, how that, from that piece of real estate, which is the size of New Jersey, has changed the whole world, Israel. Because God brought his son into that place, their own people rejected him, and now the gospel has gone to Gentiles. And when he was on that cross, Jesus said something. He said, it is finished. It is finished because every human being is trying to build a ladder to reach to God, and God found a way to reach man through the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, it is finished. So we see, when he was crucified, all the disciples were downcast, discouraging, our Messiah, our Lord is taken away. 
And on the third day, that stone was rolled away and Jesus rose from the dead. And it was very hard for them to believe that, that someone can actually rise from the dead. But that's who we worship today. Someone who is risen from the dead, who is seated at the right hand of God. And he's still doing miracles today. Let me tell you something. If Jesus was dead, I would be dead. If Je you know the miracles in your own life. If you're calling upon a name that has no power, nothing will happen. But if he is really alive and he's seated at the right hand of God that you cannot see with your naked eyeball, if there's really a, a king that's seated in the heavens above the universe who's looking upon us today and that man says he's God, then your whole life will change. And that's who the person of Christ is. And he's given us authority. And he's called us the church to be more than conquerors. So I'm going to start off with something. And it's going to be, I just want you all to follow along. If it's your new uh, first time here, I just pray that the, the Lord will help us understand this. But Matthew 28, Jesus says something after he rose from the dead. Remember, a lot of them were discouraged. Mary said, don't take him away from me. And then she found him. The two on the road to Emmaus, they were, they were discouraged. Simon, Peter, he denied him. Right, there were, there were a lot of failures, a lot of brokenness, a lot of fear. But Jesus comes, rises from the dead, and says in verse 18, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And, I, 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 and Jesus said all, and remember this word, Jesus said all authority has been given to me. What you have, if you're a born again believer, what you have living inside you is the risen king, the power of the Holy Spirit, which is greater than any nuclear reactor on this planet. You have a power greater than anything the world has ever known. And that power lives inside of you. But maybe we don't understand who we are in Christ. And the power that we possess in Christ as the resurrected church. I want to talk about something. Uh, if, if, if we can turn John 1.51. John 1.51. And I'm going to basically bring us through something I want to highlight here. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. John 1, 51. And he said to them, most surely I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open. And the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is where it's going to get a little bit uh, advanced, okay? When Jesus walked on the earth, he had the heavens open to him. Uh, let me, let me uh, just give a, a basic premise for this. In Hebrew thought, there are three heavens, you know, uh, how we claim the atmosphere, the known universe. There's called the three heavens. The first heavens, when you look up outside, you see the sky, you know, you see the blueness of it, you see the clouds. That's called the first heavens. The second heavens, according to Jewish thought, is called the known universe. The Milky Way galaxy are the bigger things than that. And there's something called the third heavens. The third heavens is where God is seated on the throne, where God reigns from. That's the place where no Hubble, James Webb telescope can see into. There's the third heavens. The third heavens is where Jesus sits and reigns and rules, and he's given us dominion on the earth. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he's given us power, power and authority to move forward as his ambassadors and representatives of his, of his person. On the, we are called the body of Christ on the earth. And for those who know, who know who Jesus is, we're called to delegate and be his representation on the earth. But Jesus says something to Nathaniel. He said, you will see heaven open and angels Ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is what you call, this is what you call when eternity meets our world. When that side of heaven meets this side of heaven, something happens over uh, our head space. The heavens open. When Jesus walked on the earth, the part of God's throne room, which was not visible to man, opened up to man. Wherever Jesus walked, 
The Bible says to Nathaniel, angels were ascending and descending over his, over his head. You see, angels, basically, he had, an, he, he had a highway over his head from earth to heaven. It's like I-495. It's like he had a highway over his head, and angels came up and down over him. Do you know, anyone know the, another time in the Bible where heaven was open and angels came up and down? Jacob's ladder. If this is new information for some of you, in the Old Testament, in Genesis 28, verse 12, there's a man called Jacob who went to a place called Bethel, which means the house of God. And when he laid his head upon the stone, the Bible says he had a dream. And the dream opened up, and it was a ladder. A ladder came uh, from earth to heaven, and angels came up and down on this ladder. And the, and the heavens were opened to, to, to Jacob at Bethel. In that time, God visited people in certain places, like Bethel. It's a certain place where God, you could walk into that place in, in, in that time, if you were living in Jacob's time. You could walk into that place in Bethel and sense that there's something different about the presence of this place. That's where God dwelt. In the New Testament, wherever Jesus walked, he brought heaven's presence wherever he walked. He had an open heavens over him. It went from a place to a person, to a person. And wherever, wherever Jesus walked, the supernatural started invading the natural. I mean, all of you sitting here, you operate with your five senses, your touch, taste, smell, sight, hearing. Let me tell you something. The unseen world is more real than the seen world. We, 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 we operate un, under what we see, what we hear, what we experience. But do you know there are things that happen in your life that you don't even have an explanation for? There are things that you, you how did I get out of that car accident? I know something should have happened to me, but I felt, you know how many people I've heard reports on 9-11, I'm not saying, I'm not making any statements here. Many people were woken up for some reason were delayed on 9-11. Something happened, felt like I shouldn't, I, I should stay back a little bit. Something happened here. And they can't explain what it was. But there are many, and I've heard this numerous times, when major catastrophes happen, they have some type of divine supernatural intervention that happens in your life. Do you know, friends, if you don't know God, God is trying to get your attention? God's trying to wake you up into a, a world that's more real than this world? You know, who, you know who believed in Jesus more than anyone else? Demons <laughs> in the New Testament. They said, you're the son of God. And Jesus said, shh, be quiet. <laughs> no one got to know that from you. You know, I, I'm trying to let everybody else know that. The Jews rejected him. People didn't believe him. The only people who believed him were de demon-possessed people. They looked at him and said, this is the son of God. You know why? They saw, his real, they saw who he was. He came in, see, you can, you can make this political. He came in as a Jewish man. I don't, I don't care what God came as, but he came, <laughs> manifested on the earth, okay? We, the enemy can twist us with this lens, and we, we see the world through this lens. Let me tell you something. When the Holy Spirit comes, the veil is taken away, and you get to see Jesus. That's our prayer for you today, that you see Jesus today. Not, not which ideology that you have, which lens that you use to view Scripture, I don't want you even to see me in a certain way. I want you to see Jesus today. My purpose is not to offend you. My purpose is to show you, uh, uh, friends, brother, there's a world more real than this one. You know that? And God's trying to get your attention. And he knows you and he loves you. There's a world more real than this world. And he's trying to hone us in. I've experienced that multiple times in my life. Things that happened in my life that I could not explain. Until I realize who God is. You know how many reports there are in the Middle East today? This was actually done in 2013. CNN re released a report. Thousands of Muslims are seeing dreams of Jesus. And they're coming to faith in Jesus in the Middle East where you, I cannot say Jesus openly. I'll be probably going to prison. But in a, in a nation, you know, the, you know where the largest uh, growth of Christianity is today? Iran. I heard that in Iran, a Muslim-controlled con nation, the largest growth of Christianity is happening in Iran. How do you explain that? If he's dead, how do you explain that? People saying, I see this man coming to me saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. How do you explain 2,000 years later, God appearing to men over and over? And this is what, what, what happened. 
The Old Testament, God appeared to Abraham, I mean, to Jacob in that dream. And Jacob saw something. Heaven was opened. And there's access. There's into our world. From his world, there's a ladder. There's a ladder. And now, thousands of years later, the, Jesus walks on the, on the earth and tells Nathaniel, it's not the ladder. I am the ladder. I am the one who brings heaven on earth. Like our Lord, the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus brings heaven to earth. He brings his domain into wherever you live, into your home, your households, your family. God brings his rule and his reign by that way. Okay. Jesus' baptism, Matthew 6, 3, 16, when he was baptized, the first thing after he took water baptism, you know what happened? Matthew 3, 16, it said the heavens were opened and he heard a voice saying, this is my son whom I love with him I'm well pleased. They're, they're all hearing, I mean, if you were there, you're, you're, you're hearing an audible voice from the sky, I would pass out. I will pass, if I saw an angel, I would pass out. You know, back in, back in Israel's day when God, um, brought them out of the Red Sea. You know, we all know the story, the Passover, how God brought the Israelites out. It said the sea split open, and there was a, a, basically a fire tornado talking to them, and, and a pillar of fire by day, and a pillar of cloud by night, and they, they, they heard the audible voice of God, and they, and, they, and they had basically chicken fall down from heaven, quail, manna. They had all these supernatural miracles, and what happened? They still didn't believe. Forty years, these Israelites wandered. I'm, I'm not talking about CGI or YouTube graphics. They, audibly, they visibly saw angels. They heard the audible voice of God, and they still wouldn't believe God. Amen. You talk about, uh, you know, I, I remember when I was a little bit more immature in my faith. I said, God, if you just move my blinds. <laughs> you know, if you just, you know, then I, I know it's you. I know I'll believe. If that's how we are, human nature. The human nature has, if they won't believe when they saw, if you see, if you see a sea split open and you won't believe, tr trust me, no blinds doing this or that's going to cause you to believe. The human heart is the same thousands of years later. Jesus says only a, he said only a wicked and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. And he said no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah the prophet. I mean, you know, Jonah was in that fish three days. And Jesus saying, I'm going to be buried. I'm going to be raised up from the dead. You know, there was a man, uh, not, not to take this uh, tangently, but, this, um, but there was a man, it, was, it said the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man went to hell. And the rich man said, Father Abraham, if you, if you let me go back and tell my brothers, they'll repent and believe you. And, and you know, Abraham said, they have Moses on the prophets. If they don't believe them, they won't even believe if a man came back from the dead. And that's honestly the story. Jesus came back from the dead. And how many had such a hard time? Even today, you know, he, his first coming was through the lamb, as a lamb, on a donkey. When he comes again, Revelation 19, he says he'll be coming on a white horse with a robe dipped in blood, with his name on his thigh that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he's going to judge all nations. You know, the biggest wake-up call for our generation was COVID, 2020. I mean, last time we had that was 100 years ago. We had the Spanish flu, World War I, the Great Depression. You read Matthew 24 of birth pains, same succession, wars, pestilence, famine. 100 years later, COVID-19, pestilence, great earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, everything Jesus said 2,000 years ago are manifesting in our time, in real time. He's coming back. But the, but the truth is, we're asleep. We're asleep. We don't know. We're distracted by this and that. And then maybe for once a year, we step into the house of God. Thank God that we are. And God tries to give, get our attention, saying, I'm here, I'm alive, and I love you. And I'm calling you. And I know some people here are going to be called today. Called into the kingdom of God. See, I thank God the greatest, you know, I suffered a lot of anxiety, depression, but I thank God I hit my lowest low. Because if I didn't have those problems, I would have never called out to God. So you know what I do? I thank God he broke me. I thank God I went through that because I could have had any, everything. The Bible says, what profit is it that you gain the whole world and lose your very soul? What is your soul worth? $100 million? $200 million? 
What price tag can you put on your soul, friends? Your soul is so precious to God. And every human being that does not know Jesus is disconnected from the power source. But Jesus came and said, it is finished to connect you back to the power source. Connect you back to your heavenly father as you accept his sacrifice. Okay, so we, we talked about this. On the nation of Israel, Elijah, okay, in 1 Kings 18, they had a power struggle between, you know, back in, what I'm saying right now, 1 Kings, all these books in the Old Testament, these are times where God physically manifested himself. That's what I'm saying. If I saw that, I, I don't know how my mind could, con you know, conceive that. But Elijah was a prophet in that time. And the nation of Israel was worshiping two different gods, basically God and this other demon god called Baal, which is a god of fertility, prosperity, all these things. They were basically idol worshiping. Elijah rebuilt the altar of the Lord. When he rebuilt the altar of the Lord, the Bible says he called down fire from heaven. The heavens were opened on Elijah because he rebuilt the altar of the Lord and the heavens opened over the nation of Israel. That also shows us in the book of Revelation, there'll be two witnesses. And the Bible says they have power to call fire from heaven. I'm not talking about CGI effects. These are going to be two witnesses on the earth during the time of the end and the Antichrist where they're going to be, have power over the heavens and the earth. And they're going to be witnessing of the Lord Jesus Christ. All these are the times we're going into, but we're in the church age. We're very close to the end. We don't know, but we were very, very close to the end. And in the end, Jesus said the end will be like the days of Noah. Uh, men were eating and drinking and having a blast and going to Applebee's and Fridays and Buffalo Wild Wings. And this old man was building a boat. And he was building a massive boat. And everybody's like, you old man, you're so crazy. Why are you building this boat? Everything is fine. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. And the Bible says they were eating and drinking and had no idea that a flood was coming. The greatest thing what we're building today and inviting you into is the ark. And the ark is Christ himself. And the Bible, Jesus said the last days will be like the days of Noah. No, no, no one will have any context of what is it. Did any of you think in 2019 of December 31st, go, did any of you think the world would never be the same again? After COVID, in one day, the whole world changed, did it not? New laws came, new regulations. You can't do the same things. You couldn't enter the same way. The whole world changed just like that. Just like that. How many of you predicted that? Nobody. None of us. None of us ever fathomed or thought in our lifetime the world would shut down like this. Let me tell you, friends, if you never see me again, there are bigger things coming. Mark my word. There are bigger things coming. And God, what he can do is get, he's like, friends, come inside the ark. Come inside the ark. There are bigger things coming. I'm not saying that as a doomsday, this or that. I'm just telling you the reality. This is where the world is headed. But it's the glorious time for the church. For the church of Jesus Christ, it is the most glorious hour and time. So Jesus said, so I don't take much longer. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Okay, all authority. So did Jesus not have authority before? Let me tell you what happens when a man prays. When a praying, of a praying person's power and effect on allowing heaven to invade earth. Okay, Daniel chapter 10. I'm just going to connect this all together. Daniel chapter 10. It talks about this man, Daniel. It says in chapter 10, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Uphaz, his body like burl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I 
retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you, and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Okay, so I just want to, uh, this is basically a, a prophet in the Old Testament who started praying in Babylon, which is Mesopotamia. And he was, an, he was a Jewish man from Israel who was taken captive into that place. And he started praying. And this man's prayer life changed history. He started praying so much that someone visited him in Daniel chapter 10. And it says he had eyes like burning fire. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. I'm going to connect this to Daniel 10. All authority has been given to me. Okay. Isn't Jesus God? Yes. Where is his authority before the cross? After the cross, Jesus said, all authority has been now given to me. You know where the authority was before this? When, and, and when Jesus was tempted, it said in the, in, the, in, the, in the wilderness that Satan came to Jesus and said, all this has been given to me and I can give to whoever, whoever I wish. When Adam, the first man, sinned, the authority was transferred from man to Satan. And when Jesus died on that cross, the Bible says he holds the keys of death and Hades. He took the authority back. So in Daniel chapter 10, when Daniel was praying, somebody met him. And this person had the eyes of burning fire, feet with burnished bronze, and his voice. Does it sound familiar? In Revelation chapter 1, when John sees Jesus, it's the exact same description of Jesus. This is an Old Testament visitation of Jesus to a man who's praying and the heavens opened up over Babylon, over that region. Because one man prayed, someone came and visited him and he was praying for 21 days. That's an answer for you that you should not stop praying. Because for 21, the Bible says he kept praying for 21 days. And then this is what the Bible says. Then he said to me, do not fear Daniel, verse 12, from the first day. That you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God. Your words were heard and have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. For I have been left alone there with the kings of Persia. This is why a lot of people are split on to believe that this is Jesus. Because if this is Jesus, what is he doing fighting against the prince of Persia? And how can anyone withstand Jesus? That makes absolute sense to me in Matthew 28, because there, there are things in this earth. When, when God enters the earth realm, he was fighting. There's a prince of Persia, which is called a principality or powers. You know, uh, you know, you know many people have this idea that Satan's in hell. And there are demons in hell. There's a lot of things happening, Sheol, Hades. But it says that Paul says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the heavenly realms. There are things over region. I come from Chicago. There's a major demonic principality over Chicago. There's a major principality over the city of New York. There's things over California. When you read Daniel 12, it says Michael, the archangel, stands over the nation of Israel. You know that iron dome which hits all these missiles? There's a war happening in heaven when Hamas and people fire rockets into Israel. Michael stands over Israel. Michael stands over the nation of Israel, and he fights for God's people. And not only that, there are angels and demons that are fighting all over the earth there was a war happening in the heavens and we're here with our mcdonald's <laughs> we're here at mcdonald's saying god what is going on in my life friends there's a war happening over your soul you know that there's wars happening over your very soul there are there's fighting taking place and this is where i want to bring our church into for those who are newcomers those who are seasoned, we are fighting a war. This warfare is real. <clears throat> this is a real warfare. When Daniel prayed, it seems to me Jesus came to visit him. A lot of people can't understand why he could not withstand the prince of Persia. He said, Michael, the archangel, came and helped me. I can understand because after the cross, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. All authority that Satan took on this earth realm that you can enter into places. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. Therefore, go. Therefore, go. This is, this is, what, this is Jesus talking about. I mean, if he, if he, uh, I, I, won't, I won't go too long on this, but I want to show you. Did Daniel see Jesus? Look at what John saw. John, uh, Revelation 1, 
Uh, verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in his strength. And when I saw him, same thing Daniel said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me and saying to me, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and I have the keys of Hades and of death. Look at what John saw, look at what Daniel saw. I see parallels here. That is beyond description. Jesus visited this man of the Old Testament. Daniel, who did not have the Holy Spirit, his prayer life made such an impact that Jesus, I believe, came and visited him in Daniel 10. He didn't even have the Holy Spirit. I mean, the way that we do, the baptism, the the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But this one man, who Daniel chapter 1, it said he chose not to defile himself. He stayed pure. His prayer life caused heaven to encounter earth. He was a pure altar, may I say that. And then we have, we have evidences of, of God opening up the heavens. What happens when o- the heavens are opened over your home? Salvation. Salvation, ha- when God opens up the heavens over your home, the blessing of the Lord flows into your home. Life flows into the home. Healing flows into the home. Sickness starts to appear because wherever Jesus went, life came. Because he stand under an open heaven. Let me tell you something today. God wants to open the heavens over your homes, over the church, over this region. When God opens up, the presence of God starts moving into your family. Your homes will be transformed. Your lives will never be the same. And so this is the very thing that the enemy wants to keep bound up. So, what is, so this is where I'm going I'm to bring everything to. Conclusion two, what does it mean for us? When Jesus came and rose from the dead, he rebuilt altars, 120 of them. People who were, just Peter who denied him, Mary who was distraught, the two on the road to Emmaus, they said, we thought Jesus was the one, but he died and we didn't know. He restored them. He comforted Thomas who said, unless I see him, I will not believe. He restored the altars. The altars, which is men's hearts, people, and the 120 of them were gathered together. And it says from Acts 1 to Acts 2, they were praying. These are human, broken people. Some of them, all of them denied Jesus. All of them forsook Jesus. Peter denied him three times. They seemed like they were failures. They seemed like they had nothing to withstand the, the Roman oppression and the Jewish onslaught on, uh, from the high priest on Jesus. But these are failures that God restored, healed. And he said, wait, wait until the day of Pentecost because the helper is coming. The Holy Spirit is coming. And he restored the altars. You know when he restored the altars? It was on the 40th day. The day of Pentecost is the 50th day. For 10 days they were praying. And the atmosphere, I mean, if you're praying 10 days straight, the atmosphere changes in a place. The atmosphere was changing. And you see, when you read Acts 2, it says, when the day of Pentecost fully came... A sound came from heaven of a mighty rushing wind. That means the heavens were opened over Jerusalem. But Jesus is not there, but the church is there now. And the heavens are opened over Jerusalem. And the Spirit of God came and filled the church. And they started praying and speaking in other dialects and languages. And all these people understood them. But see, I want to to bring something to us today. What gives us power as a church? You know... You know the Bible verse that says in Matthew 18, 18, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Do you know what it says before that? It says before that, Matthew 18. And this is, this is how we have an open heavens over. It's going to be very simple. I'm going to bring this all to a conclusion. We want an open heavens. But there's a, pre, but there's a, there's a principle behind this. If you want God to move in your life, this is what God says, Matthew 18, 15. And this is what the cross has did for us. The cross has reconciled us to God. That means we also got to be reconciled to each other. More, and this, this, is where, this is where it's going to get really simple. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if, you'll, if he will not hear, 
Take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses to hear in the church, let him be like to you a heathen tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. The way we see God's kingdom come on the earth is first we get our relationships right. We can bind and loose and ask God to come all we want. But if we're not reconciled, you know what it says in the book of Acts? They were in one accord. Not Honda. (laughs) They were in one accord. Okay? They were in one accord. That means they were unified. One heart, one mind. And you know what happened? The power of God came upon the church. When they were unified together as the body of Christ, the heavens opened up over that church. Right? And here we have Jesus saying, and I always read that saying, God, I bind this, I loose this. But the thing is, if I'm not living right, I can bind all the, I can say, ask all this stuff. But if my heart is not reconciled to my neighbor, and if I have any grudges in my heart, God's not going to, God's not going to do miracles. What Jesus did on the cross is he reconciled us back to God the Father as his beloved, not counting our sins against him. So when we, when we are joined together, as what, see, this is what Satan wants. The, Matthew 24 says, in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. Meaning people, you know, and, this, and Jesus said earthquakes, famines, pestilences, and then he dropped something in there. And, you know, you would think earthquakes, pestilence, famine, wars, rumors of wars, false prayer. And then he drops this one thing. I, and by the way, many people are going to stop loving each other. And he said, that's going to be a sign the end has come. The love of many, it says, will wax cold. Meaning uh, the tender heart that you used to have has now become numb and cold. Will wax cold. This is what makes the church unique more than any other religious entity is our unity among the brethren. The unity among the brethren. And that's what, I, that's what I want to show to you. Today we have how many nations sitting before me? How many different types of people? This is a sign of the church. Every tribe, language, nation, and tongue coming before the throne of Almighty God. This is what the church of God will look like. And it says there, Matthew 10, Acts 7, when, when, and when Stephen was being stoned, it said they have, Jesus, he saw heaven open and Jesus standing over, uh, uh, over uh, Stephen. And, you know, Stephen said this, Father, don't hold the sin against him. When he reacted like Christ, when he showed Jesus' nature, and when he was being stoned, the heavens opened up over Stephen because Jesus was being shown. What does this mean for us? Jesus has taken a bunch of people, tax collectors, zealots, fishermen, people of different ideologies and different political backgrounds, all together in one room called 120 people. These were failures. These were broken human beings. These people would never be in this. I'm, if it wasn't Easter, would any of you be in the same room today? No. <laughs> it's all of us up here because of Jesus and an invitation and has brought us here into the house of God. But see, those people who were politically different, Ideology, uh, ideologies that were so different, zealots, tax, these are people who never get along, are now called together to be in one room, and they were called to love the way Jesus loves, they were called to forgive the way Jesus forgives, and they were in one room, all different people, and the Bible says when they were in one accord on the 10th day of the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon that church. Miracles started happening in that church, and 3,000 people came to know Jesus. On that day, because the church came together, nations came together, people came together, and this is what the devil wants. He wants it in our government. He wants it, you know, whether you watch CNN, Fox News, whatever, he wants us all divided. But you know how we're united? In Christ. In Christ is the only way you can ever be friends with that guy who said, I will never get along with that guy. You will see people in heaven that you thought you'd never get along with. Because God has forgiven them. Now it's up to us to forgive them. God is for okay. And, 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 to, and to bring this uh, to this place, if you, if you just turn with me to Ephesians 2 uh, real quick, and I'll just read that for time's sake, and then we're just going to pray for us as a body. Ephesians 2, uh, verse 14, it says, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, 
having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is a law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, therefore, therefore putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and to those who are near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Here we have Jesus saying Jew and Gentile, because it was only for the Jewish people at that time. But through the cross of Jesus Christ, both Jews and Gentiles are made as one new man. One new man. And he divided the dividing wall of separation, which is the Ten Commandments, all these things that the Jewish nation had, the Gentiles didn't. What did Jesus do? He united everybody back to Adam. Adam was one man. In Christ, he's called the second Adam. Right? He's, the, he's the last. And in Christ, every human beings that are separated all over the earth, all over the, after Noah's flood, he had three sons. That's where you have all the languages. All our, our people groups, our ethnicities come from Noah's three sons after Noah's flood. And some went to Asia, some went to different parts of Europe. There were nomadic people. That's where we all come from. But in Christ, whether you're Jewish or all of us mostly here are Gentiles, through Jesus Christ, we are made back as one human person, was one person, was one new man in Christ Jesus. We are made to show the world that we are united through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the power of the church. That's, the, that's where we can pray and we see heaven move when we come together, when we put aside our political differences, our preferences, our lenses, our biases, our racism. All the, and it's saying, you know, you're not like me. You don't look like me. You don't talk like me. But the blood of Jesus has made us all one. We are all one in Christ. I can't say I'm better than you. You're better than me. I can't say I have this or that. In Christ, we are made one new man. That's the power of the church. That's the power of the resurrection. Of the resurrection. If you could put that picture up that I had. This is a unique picture. This, this is a church in the New Testament called Antioch. Acts 13. Acts 13 says, Now in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simon, who was called Niger from Africa, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod and te the Tetrarch and Saul. These are people who were brought under Herod who wanted to kill Jesus, people from different uh, uh, ethnic backgrounds, and Saul who wanted to kill the church, Saul who wanted to kill Christians, Niger who came from Africa, this man who was under Herod who was against Christ, all now coming together in the church of Antioch in Acts 13. And they were brought together, men of different nationalities and backgrounds. This is where the church started. This is where we started as one group. Now we got denominations, we got all these different things, you know, splitting us. But in Christ, God is bringing us all back into one group. And it says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Meaning... They were so united that the Holy Spirit started talking to the church as they were worshiping and saying, set these two men apart for the missions movement. The missions movement started at Antioch, this church, not at Jerusalem. Because at Jerusalem, they were still Jews. They didn't want to deal with Gentiles. They didn't want to deal with people like us. They were saying, like, oh, no, we can't go to the Gentiles. We can't go to that people group. But see, Jesus told Peter, don't call any man unclean who I made clean. I am making all people come into my family. And Peter went, broke through that barrier, and the church started growing, and this church started looking different than Jewish people. Because the first church was just Jewish Christians. You got to see this. It's not any one of us. Then uh, we started coming into the picture. And now thousands of years later, Satan wants to divide us again. And when he divides us again, the power leaves the church again. We want to see miracles. We want to see open heavens over our family. We want to see the fullness of God's power, we need to come together as one people. As one, come out of this, the world will tell us, you're this, you're that, you're different. And Christ will tell us we are one. We are one. And that's Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17. I pray, Father, that they may be one as I am in one with you. As me and you, Father, are one. May the love that you have for me be in them. This is the greatest witness to the world that people like this all can come together and work together 
through the power of the Holy Spirit. People that don't look like each other. And there's many of you who've been brought into this church. And maybe for such a time as this, God has brought you into a, a, a context that you might be unfamiliar and uncomfortable with. But this is what heaven's going to look like. It's not going to look like you. It's going to look like all different groups of people working together for one common cause. Folks, we have, we have people that need to be saved. We have a resurrected Christ we need to display, but we need to do it through love, through his love, through his unity, through reconciliation. That's why God, this is what Jesus says, I have forgiven you. I have forgiven you, but will you forgive your neighbor? I have forgiven you. I have canceled your debt on that tree. I have forgiven you, and you can accept my forgiveness. Now will you, in turn, show the same forgiveness that you've been received? And have the church come together. You know, this is why I love seeing uh, who is before me today. We're all different. But we're all under one name tonight. Uh, this morning. It's the name of Jesus Christ. This is the hope of Easter Sunday. Your sins are forgiven. And there is life after this life. There is a life after this life. And God is calling some of you to enter into that new life. God is calling some of you here that you've met. You know, the Bible says, unless a man is born again, and we're done here. Unless a man is born again, he shall not see the kingdom of heaven. You know what being born again means? All of us have a soul inside of us. And if that soul, once that soul realizes that Jesus Christ has died your death and taken your punishment, and you've accepted his sacrifice and you turn from your sin, the Bible says you are born again by the Spirit of God. You receive Christ, his forgiveness, and you are made right with God. You have peace with God. Thank you everyone for joining us this week on the One Church Podcast. Be sure to tune in next week. We hope you found value in this podcast and we'd appreciate you sharing us with others and telling your friends and family to follow along with us on Spotify and other platforms. Our prayer and hope is that this podcast, the content that we produce, can reach countless lives. So follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Subscribe to our YouTube and Spotify at One Church LI. That is One Church LI. And visit us at our website, onechurchonline.com. Onechurchonline.com. Here at One Church, our vision is to see Jesus, and we exist to reach the one with the love of Jesus and for all to live like Jesus. So we want to see Jesus in you and in each other. And we pray and believe there is more for you.